few years ago, my children bought me a journal. It's a, a man's way of saying I have a diary. But I've been keeping a diary and I've uh, been doing this as a matter of, of practice for a number of years. And uh, in, in that journal that I do, uh, I have a bucket list. And on that bucket list are just some things that I would like to do. Uh, and I won't tell you all of those things, but one of those things was accomplished a couple of years ago. And that is my wife and I were able to go to Israel together. And uh, what a thrill that was to be able to be there and uh, see the terrain and see the different cities and the places uh, where ministry took place, where the gospel uh, was taken care of and preserved for us so that we could receive it. One of the most beautiful areas as we drove in the area of Jerusalem was in a city nearby, it was Bethlehem, about six miles south of Jerusalem, are the beautiful rolling hills of Bethlehem. You can almost picture how peaceful it would be as you imagine those rolling hills. The grass wasn't as lush there as it is here, but you could see it if you looked close and there was a lot of uh, growth around, enough to sustain sheep. It must have been similar to what was seen when Mary and Joseph made their way to Bethlehem. By the time we get to Luke chapter 2, which is where we're at today, several things have already happened. Mary found out she was pregnant. When she found out she was pregnant, she also found out that Elizabeth was pregnant. In fact, Elizabeth was six months pregnant. An angel had come to, to Mary and told her these things. Somewhere along the line, she told Joseph, who became very upset. He was distraught. He didn't know what to do. Uh, he was afraid. He was fearful. It was during that time of Joseph's fear that I believe Mary made her way to the area of Jerusalem, which is where she stayed with Elizabeth. She arrived there somewhere after Elizabeth's sixth month. And so she may have been with Elizabeth a couple of months. Now the journey for Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem was about 90 to 100 miles so if you are hiking on really good, straight, and flat roads, you could probably do 30 miles a day. If you're hiking on terrain that's like the Appalachian Trail, you would have to be in good shape to do 20 or 25. Well, here, if they were hiking very rapidly, they could have done it in three days, but more likely it was a week's journey. Mary made her way from Nazareth all the way to the area near Jerusalem to be with Elizabeth and Zacharias. It was then that she came back. When she came back, an angel had appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him not to be afraid. It's interesting how many times in the, the birth of Christ, the story of the birth of Christ, where, it, where uh, the people in the story are told, do not be afraid or stop being afraid. Well, Joseph was told, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. They were already kind of married, though it was not yet completed. They had not yet consummated their marriage, but it had been instituted. And so they were married. When Mary came back from the area of Bethlehem, Joseph took her as his wife. We know all of that from the preaching before and because we know the Christmas story. Today we're in Luke 2. Joseph has found out he has to go to Bethlehem. Why Bethlehem? That's where he was from. And because he was of the house and lineage of David. You see, Caesar Augustus had made a decree that all the world should be taxed. Now, as you study history, you realize that it wasn't all on one day. The whole world had to converge and do a tax, but the whole world was taxed, probably happened in waves, and it was the, the time for Bethlehem to give an accounting. And so anybody that was from Bethlehem had to go and pay a tax. It was during the time when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. So they went to be taxed. So Mary's making her second journey as a pregnant woman on foot. Maybe there was a donkey involved. Maybe not. If there was a donkey involved, probably carrying uh, stuff rather than people. But she may have ridden on a donkey. I don't know how comfortable it is to ride on a donkey while you're pregnant. However, she could have ridden on a donkey. More than likely, this was a journey by foot. Mary's taking her second trip during her pregnancy. This time, though, it's different because the Bible says she was great with child. And so Joseph and Mary made their way to Bethlehem. And it was while they were there, they arrived in Bethlehem and they found that 
there was no place for them to stay. Now, if you went to your hometown, it might be the case that a lot of people know you there. Depends on the size of the town. Now, if I go back home to Holmesville, New York, uh, population 100, salute. You know, it's like barely 100 people in that town. They know who I am. Even 35 years later, I haven't been back home for 35 years. Um, they would know who I am. The people in Bethlehem knew Joseph. Now, the city of Bethlehem today in Israel is probably about 30,000 people, maybe half the size of the city of Lancaster. So it's sizable. But in those times, it was not. It was a very simple and modest farming community. A lot of farmers, it was very simple construction. Uh, may I say rudimentary. It was not fancy construction. These people were farmers. They were workers. It was a bedroom community for Jerusalem. Not far from Jerusalem. In fact, I'm sure they were used to having people stay there during the time of the Passover or other celebrations in Jerusalem. Well, Mary and Joseph made their way to Bethlehem, uh, and while, it it was, uh, while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because, say it with me, there was no room for them in the inn. So they didn't have holiday inns. There was no Motel 6. They didn't leave the light on for you. They probably didn't know you were coming until you got there. Or maybe they knew, well, in a month or so, uh, Mary's going to be coming. We should have a, a spot ready for her. It was houses. An inn would have been a house where people would have hosted those who are guesting. Maybe there were a couple of houses that were dedicated to money making. But more than likely, it was just homes. And these homes, how they were built in Bethlehem, I've seen some of them. They were built on a hillside where the major part of the home was above ground, and below ground would be a cave, which was kind of a barn area. And so the barn and the house were connected. If Jesus left the door open, you might be tempted to ask him if he was born in a barn, right? And the truth is he was, because there was no room in the house part. It wasn't that the house was the barn and the barn was the house. They were connected and associated in all likelihood. And it wasn't being rude to Mary and Joseph to tell them there was no room in the house because it seems like they came to the party a little bit late. When they got there, they needed a place to stay, and so they stayed in the barn part of the house where the feed was kept, where they would feed animals and treat the animals. And it was there that there was a feeding trough carved out, likely out of stone, where Jesus was laid. Mary gave birth to him. It was in the same country, in the same area around Bethlehem. If you were to go there today and see the hills, you would see much of what Mary and Joseph saw back in those times. It probably looks very similar. Take away some of the buildings that are there, more modern buildings, and just picture those rolling hills. And so it was uh, in the same country that there were shepherds. I love this. They were abiding in the fields, like they're living in the fields. I love that. I could picture myself being a shepherd. I think I would enjoy it. Now, it wasn't the highest occupation of the land. Uh, it wasn't fancy, and it wasn't looked favorably upon, but somebody had to do it, right? I grew up working on dairy farms, and so I know what it's like. I suppose a shepherd back in those days, uh, every time they went into the barn and did the chores, didn't throw their, their clothes in the laundry. You get what I'm saying? These guys had the same outfit for like a month. It's every boy's dream to wear the same clothes every day. These guys are out in the fields. They're making campfires. Uh, I can picture that the night when Jesus was born, a whole bunch of shepherds getting together, a whole bunch of flocks of sheep. They could mix together because when a shepherd left, when he would give his signal, the sheep would know who their shepherd is and they would come. I can picture sheep all around and in the middle, maybe 10, 15, 20, maybe 30 shepherds all together making their meal. Sometimes they lived off the land. Sometimes they had food that they brought with them. Um, these are guys that would camp out for like a month. Doesn't that sound fun? And then when they went to sleep, they would lay on the ground and look up at the stars. Not a lot of light pollution in those days. And so they could see the stars very brightly. 
And it was that these shepherds were in the same country, abiding in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. I mean, what did that look like? I hope we can do an instant replay of all these Bible stories one day. I kind of picture it's like, here's this angel, he appears. And these are grown men. I mean, they got weapons, uh, they're rough, they're joking around, they're telling stories, uh, they're laughing, maybe some have laid down to go to sleep already, and lo, an angel was there. All of a sudden, he suddenly appears. And it's not just that he appeared, it says that the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and these grown men were sore afraid. They were fearful. And the angel said to them, fear not. Why? These are, the, these are wonderful words. Savor these words. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Say it with me. Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Isn't that fabulous? Here's the reason for the joy. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. That is no small thing. I suppose if somebody knocked on your door and said, I have a good news for you, you would hope that, well, I, I won the publisher's clearinghouse or whatever it is, you know. Every year, mom and dad would get that in the mail, and there'd be this fake key or whatever, and I was sure we won, and I would scour, and uh, we never won. I don't think anybody ever won, really, but probably somebody out there really did. But maybe we would think that would be good news. There's far greater news, and to that society, this was good news as well that the Savior had come. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Jesus has come. And here's what that means to us, that one day there is going to be a kingdom where there will be peace without end. And that today, so there's the later benefits, there's the today benefits, he will save his people from their sin. People who have willingly chose sin over God and willingly chose to rebel against God. God, throughout the history of humanity, has sought for man to be reconciled to him. And so he sent Jesus, that's the good news, so that we could be reconciled and we would never pay the price for sin in eternity. God made a way for us. And after 400 years of silence between the end of the Old Testament and the New Testament, we finally have activity and things going on. The Savior has come. Good news of great joy. So the angel is urging the shepherds, go and check us out. Check me out. See if it's true. You're going to be able to find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and rags, lying in a manger in a feeding trough. And then before the, the shepherds went to find this baby, suddenly... There was with the angel, it was a, a, an angel host, an angel army. You ever heard that song, an angel army? This was an angel army that wasn't singing probably, but they could have been. Praising God and saying, I know you know this, say it with me. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. The shepherds then went to see the baby, found the baby lying in a manger, uh, told everybody all the things that they had seen and heard. Mary pondered these things in her heart. The shepherds then went back to the fields rejoicing in the thing that God had done. Good tidings of great joy. It was 300 years ago this Christmas that the song, Joy to the World, was penned, but it was not penned first as a song, it was a poem. A poem written by a man named Isaac Watts 300 years ago. Isaac Watts' father actually was put in jail a couple times because he was a nonconformist. He refused to, to acknowledge the authority of the Anglican Church, and he decided, hey, we need to be able to follow the, the Bible and stand on the Word of God. Isn't that good? Isaac learned from his father and thought, I'm going to follow the Bible. I don't care what anybody says. But he had this one complaint with his father. Maybe this will hit a little too close to home for some of us. He said to his dad, I can't believe these people are singing these psalms. They're singing such beautiful, rich words, but they don't look like they believe what they're singing. In fact, their facial expressions, their body 
um, movements, everything else. It just makes me think they don't really believe what they're even singing. His father got tired of Isaac Watts complaining, and he said, why don't you go write some of your own songs? The practice then was to sing psalms, and they would have a few different tunes that, the, t- tunes that they would sing the psalms to. Well, Isaac Watts decided, how about I take the psalms, put them in words that can be understood by the people sitting out there, and give it a tune which speaks in the beauty and language of today. And so it was that Isaac Watts became the father of our modern day hymn, uh, uh, hymnology. Um, one of the songs he wrote was Joy to the World. He wanted people to, to understand it and sing it and have a, a sense of joy that the Lord has come. The song Joy to the World is written based on Psalm 98. As you read through Psalm 98, at first blush, it might not really match up. But if you go through the psalm, you'll realize that it's a psalm which talks about the fact the Lord has come. For the psalmist, it was still future. For us, the Lord has come. And then it talks about earth receiving our king and having a time of rejoicing. And so joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. The earth will one day. Meanwhile, we can, because let every heart prepare him room. Have you prepared room for Christ the king? Jesus came. That is no small statement. He made a way for us to be reconciled to God. He got in trouble for us so that we wouldn't get in trouble in eternity. God will not tolerate sin in his heaven. Sin must be paid for. Jesus paid for it. And so we can receive that payment through repentance, through faith and believing in Jesus Christ. Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Has your heart made room? And if it has, then you can join all heaven and earth and all creation as we sing joy to the world. You see, there's a reason for peace in the midst of the chaos of this world. And the reason for our peace is the joy that comes because Christ is born.